It's not every day you get to hear the private recordings of a billionaire, but insight from Ukraine and Russia has given us an absolutely wild look at the inside of Russian billionaires. Their phones taps and has been tapped and they have uh, revealed the truth. Now, obviously, guys, Insight is a great channel, but YouTube always cracking down on him. He actually was banned for like two weeks recently. You can see, uh, I linked to his channel below. You should absolutely become a member and support the channel. Um, if you want to support me, uh, the way to do that is actually going to be on my site, combatvetnews.com. Uh, let me pull it up here for you guys. Um, combatvetnews.com functions like Patreon. Uh, we've got uh, I mean, I give away all my YouTube videos for free on here. I have all of the news stories I can't get to in the daily updates, but I also, just like Patreon, you can become a member, support the channel. It's less expensive than Patreon because it's my own site. They don't have to take a cut. And I check out all the GoPro footage, the POV footage, the drone footage, all the crazy combat videos. We break them all down and get insights about the front lines. Links in the description. All right, let's, let's, let's do this intercept. This is going to be wild, guys. The guy who's standing close to Putin in this photo is Roman Tartsenko. He's a Russian billionaire. And so yesterday his conversation with Russian businessman Nikolai Matushevsky was released online, most likely by the Russian Federal Security Service. I'm not sure why they've done it, but anyways, let's listen to what they have to say. <laughs> Вот я не знаю, понимал, что-то что не то, потому что, ну, ну, нечего там делать, то есть, понимаешь, как бы я там что-то оптимизировал. Ну, да, 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 и люди уехали, ну, как-то как так. Не надо вспоминать, что было в России, потому что этого уже нет и не будет. This is interesting. Now, I have some actual insight that might, may give us a little additional information. And... It's fascinating that he attributes this to the Russian FSB, given that Insight doesn't usually attribute the source of any of his other leaked calls. And so I think it is the Russian FSB. It would be really hard to tap a billionaire's phone. Billionaires, you have to understand, they're not like the, the uh, you know... You, the neighbor, ne the neighbor next door whose wife is a doctor, right, and who uh, drives a Tesla. They're not that kind of rich. They are insulated by layers and layers and layers of people, helpers, what they call family offices. So one of the things that they do is have very excellent cybersecurity. You notice how only once did Jeff Bezos get his uh, his in personal information compromised, and that was only because he was having an affair with his now girlfriend, and apparently the girlfriend's like brother got the photos and tried to blackmail him. And Jeff Bezos... Don't kid yourself, and his PR team, because that's almost certainly what he has, navigated the crisis beautifully. He said, I don't care. You can release them. I'm not a sex symbol. Uh, and then you notice you've never heard about it since because he managed to completely bury that incident. Um, that's the kind of, of, of intensive uh, resources that these billionaires bring to their security. And that's a U.S. billionaire I'm talking about. Now, a Russian billionaire, ratchet that up to the next level. So it's almost certain that this is done by the FSB. No one else could get the kind of access you would need. I agree. Uh, but here's where things get interesting, is that there is a sort of silent civil war inside of Russia right now. And it is between Prigozhin and the Wagner Group and Russian uh, the Russian military establishment. But Prigozhin has actually made some interesting statements. I'm going to try to find some quotes here for you. Um, but basically, uh, he has started um, talking about, here we go, Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, who has positioned himself as a sort of alternative to the Russian Ministry of Defense, he actually recently has published an article criticizing what he calls Russia's, quote, deep state, unquote in an essay published, uh, let's see, looks like two weeks ago. And he said that the country was in a state of crisis. He criticized the Russian state elites, who he said, quote, operate independently of the political leadership of the state and have close ties and their own agenda. Sounds a lot like this Russian billionaire. Uh, let's see if we can uh, see a little bit about, a little more about Roman Tatsenko. 
Uh, obviously, he has scrubbed a lot of the information on himself from the internet, certainly from Wikipedia. Um, and he looks like he is in a energy consortium, uh, right? And a carbon company, so probably oil. So it looks like he is in Russian oil and gas. Um, but so he is definitely firmly inside of these Russian elites that Prigozhin is so critical of. Now, bear in mind, Prigozhin's Wagner Group is its independent entity, but he has a lot of ties to a lot of other organizations, especially within the Russian military and security state. There are many, some generals in the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense who are considered proxies for Wagner Group. Um, and he certainly has been on a campaign of criticism of these Russian uh Russian state elites. He calls them a decadent elite, right? Um, and he's been very visible, right? Uh, let's see if we can get to, right, there. If it's, he says, quote, if Russia gets to the bottom, then it will push them off from there. Uh, and then it would float back up like a huge sea monster, demolishing everything in its path. He's describing, of course, Russians. And he says Russia needs to keep fighting, warning to ignore the elites who want Russia, who want Russia to cut its losses in the war. Uh, and it's really interesting. Um, it's, And I think we need to understand that the chances are, I think that is what this is. This leak was by an FS, a Wagner or Prigozhin affiliated member of the FSB, who wants to call out and criticize and validate Prigozhin's criticisms of Russian billionaires who are seen as being cosmopolitan, don't have loyalty to Russia. Instead, they have loyalty to themselves and to uh, their money. Today's video is sponsored by Siege World War II. Siege World War II is a mobile real-time strategy game where you raise and command armies and engage in epic PvP battles. Unlock and collect the ultimate troop upgrades and tactics, form clans to share cards, and dominate the global leaderboards. With over 40 seasons and over 1 million downloads, this game is constantly getting upgrades, new challenges, and rewards. Use my link in the description or the QR code to download and play for free. А надо пытаться в новых местах найти что-то, да, что э, твою особенность и конкурентную способность подчеркнуть. You can see his friend is describing, well, you just, it, you know, Russia's not what you want anymore. You need to find a new place that stands out and, and keeps you happy while providing you a livelihood, right? And this is, to a Russian nationalist, uh, this is um, a, a huge betrayal. Right. Uh, this is like if someone is a, a, a an America first rah rah America person, this would be like the president, not quite the president, but this would be like one of the president's, uh, you know, wealthy allies or a, or a high net worth donor calling and saying, oh, listen, America, America sucks, dude. Uh, we need to find another country and hey, just live in any old country that will let you make a living and that uh, will treat you well. Try Singapore, or Hong Kong, right? You'd be like, wow, how is this person donating and making decisions uh, about U.S. politics while simultaneously trying to leave the country and expressing no loyalty for it? See, he's describing leaving Russia for Indonesia, just trading countries the way you and I trade outfits. You buy something or rent it or something, it will all grow. Yeah, he's describing the This is fascinating that they, the again, also billionaires have access to data um, and analytics that you and I don't. They're going to have a team. Um, again, these what they call a family office in the United States. This is the the uh, a team of employees whose only job is to manage not the businesses that he owns, but the private wealth he controls. This is how family offices work, and they become so complex and they get access to information that everyone else doesn't, right? Because they can do their own analysis, sure. But it's also because they can talk to people that you and I can never talk to. He may have this information straight from the Indonesian prime minister, 
right? He may have this information from the head of the Indonesian bank. He may have this from the, the, the head of the IMF. Billionaires have access to people and insight that you and I can never compete with. It's one of the reasons why all your friends, everyone has a friend that like traded stocks during like the 2020 boom and they thought they were all geniuses, but the truth is they were always going to be suckers. They were always going to be retail traders because they don't have any of that privileged information, right? You have to be a congressman. This is why this is why the US Congress can uh, are better traders and investors. They get bigger returns than any almost any hedge fund in the country. And the reason is because they have exclusive proprietary information and they use it to make money. This is what these Russian billionaires are doing. Yeah, this is seen as, again, an extreme criticism of Russia in the war. To an ultranationalist, this is absolute anathema. Um, this is, again, sort of like, uh, it's hard to find an analogy. Again, this is, would be like a large donor to a major U.S. party um, calling and being like, this country's run by idiots. Everybody's running out these these scenarios from the 19th century. They're hopeless. America's hopeless. We need to get out of here, right? And imagine saying that in private and in public donating to a major political party. This is fascinating. This is a really fascinating look. I would again, it's so rare to get these sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um <coughs> between ultra ultra wealthy people and then especially someone who's so connected to the russian state Слушай, я знаешь, что хотел сказать? Я тут мне там прислали ссылку. Это нарезка новогодних поздравлений, с, начинается с Ельцина, когда он сказал, что я устал, я ухожу в 99 год. I love it. They're still sharing each other YouTube videos. I also love when billionaires are just like as, as trashy as the rest of us. Ooh, that's not good. Directly criticizing Putin and calling him a moron. That's a bad look. That's a bad look for a Russian billionaire, especially a Russian billionaire who makes a lot of his money from the state. But here's the thing that's sort of fascinating. Again, I think Putin goes and did this because if you're not on record as calling Putin a fucking moron, then you can be an ally of Putin's and slowly, without a raising suspicion, transition your wealth away from Russia, transition yourself to, I guess, Indonesia, um, and slowly dis divest yourself from the Russian state. But now that he is publicly on record as calling Putin a stinking moron, uh, that means he needs to cast his lot with someone who can protect him. He needs, he, he cannot try to split down the middle or be a neutral party. They're forcing this player off the sidelines. And if you're Prigozhin, who aspires to replace Putin, then forcing a major Russian power broker to get off the sidelines and forcing them to publicly come over to your side, because again, he's, he, there's no coming back from this. That's actually beneficial to Prigozhin. Плохой год, но мы всех победим. Вот это все 20 лет, все 
там вот в уши сыпься. То есть, понимаешь, вот да. посмотрев вот это, вот, вот хочется спросить, слушайте, ну вот это вы правда считаете, что вот этот человек может страной управлять? Если он одно и то же каждый год говорит, как это был тяжелый год, и как мы вытерпели, а, а последнее время уже после 14 года он просто, знаешь, вот прям вот, мы победим, все враги, прям вот, вот. This is a very common tactic among authoritarians. Uh, this isn't exclusive. Uh, I'm surrounded on all sides by enemies. Uh, everyone is the ally. Everyone is an enemy. No one is an ally. Um, your suffering is uh, is only temporary. Um, all of my mistakes, all my mistakes are caused by the fact that we're surrounded by enemies. And The truth is, just like the most annoying friend you have, who every time something bad happens to them, they blame the economy, they blame their boss, they blame their friends, they blame everyone but themselves. And this is a common authoritarian tactic. They try to blame everyone but themselves for their failings. Um, and you know, their goal is to just convince enough people that it's true, to sow a little doubt. Um, But it becomes increasingly preposterous. As we know, there was a time in the early 2000s where the U.S., Russia was potentially being welcomed into the European community, where Russia had a real chance to be a, a major mem a member of NATO, a member of the EU. Um, and so this sort of everyone is my enemy is, is manufactured. It's manufactured by Russia. And these billionaires, right, as cosmopolitan as they are, they see it. They see the difference between Indonesia, who's not, uh, you know, a, a subordinate state to anyone, but Indonesia is engaged in the international community. They're a major trading partner. They're a growing economy. They have a democratically elected process. It's it's, you know, they have their struggles, right? But fundamentally, that's why they're a growth country. Как может жить и развиваться страна, где есть диалоги, является заработанием бабок, а задачей сохранения власти на группу людей. Причем на вопрос... Yeah, this is, this is one of the core problems with a country, is that it devises a new method to grow, to achieve growth and prosperity, but then some people win and some people lose when you have A, a, a prosperous growth method, right? And it dates back, look, you can look at like the Aztecs. The Aztec empire was was created because they had access to obsidian, a very, 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 very valuable commodity. It was not, it was the sharpest thing you could get before, uh, before smelting and steel was developed. And so the problem, of course, is that it created this class of elites who had direct access to the obsidian and were able to profit from its from trading it. And eventually, over time, the elite core of the country stopped looking at themselves, the 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 nation or the empire's success as being a the, uh, they weren't stewards of the empire's success they believed themselves to be the success. Like their existence was more important than making the actual thing that made the empire successful. This is how every one of them goes. And once you have that switch where keeping elite, wealthy, powerful subsets of people in that position is more important than actually making the country prosperous or or functional or uh, then it's on its way to collapse because the necessary changes because the world is always changing and you have to change with it and when you can't change with it because it would mean eroding however incrementally the existing power base the group of people uh you're never going to get the changes that you want а что будет дальше, я вам сказать, да, And it's going to collapse. Дальше не будет. Да, да? Никакой же концепции дальше нет, понимаешь? Они помрут в какой-то момент времени, и они не оставят за собой ничего. Это просто будет выжженная пустыня. Потом для всех дает, и выяснится, что уже поздно. Люди не могут уже поздно деньги, не могут выехать, mm -hmm. их дети призваны на войну, там, еще что-то. Ну, да, там тоже такое ощущение, что 23-й это такой последний год, когда можно что-то поменять и там где-то уехать да. или что-то начать делать. Потому да. что в 24-м и дальше там же уже эти выборы, и там так уже гайки закрутят.
Oh, man, this is also being blatant. Uh, admitting, basically, the elections are fraudulent. Interesting. If anyone has any insight as to what this could mean, I'm all ears. Ну, родину то мы любим, просто есть люди, которые не любят, а мы ничего с ними сделать не можем. Поэтому я прямо так к этому отношусь. Interesting. This is very interesting. This guy's just going on a rant. And you notice M here is very generic. I love the motherland. There are people who don't, and we can't do anything about them. It's not clear who he's talking about. It's very, very vague. I wonder if M knows he's being recorded. When the richest people of Russia no longer see the point in staying in Russia, it's a very good sign. They take money from Russia elsewhere, and so they won't be spent on Putin's war machine. Oh man, this this has been truly wild, guys. This is this has been a, a an unusually wild one. Um, as always, thank you guys uh, so much for uh, joining me. Um, let me know in the comments if there's other Russian billionaires that have publicly come out and uh, and been critical of the state and lived to tell the tale. Um, I appreciate you guys, and I'll see you in the next one.